What's up guys, we're going to be talking about objects in programming. It almost seems a rite of passage that for the first few months of writing code, you'll be struggling with the question, what exactly is an object? And it's very difficult to get a straightforward answer to what an object is. Let me just give you a quick example from Wikipedia. So I've Googled what is an object in programming. The first hit there, an object is an abstract data type with the addition of polymorphism and inheritance. Rather than structure programs as code and data, an object-oriented system integrates the two using the concept of an object. Now there's nothing wrong with that definition, it just doesn't mean anything to the vast majority of new programmers. The thing that makes this especially more complex is that the definitions don't all seem to add up with each other. For example, if we look at the very next definition, what is the meaning of object in programming? In object-oriented programming, objects are the things you think about first in designing a program, and they're also the units of code that are eventually derived from the process. Seems to be a completely different definition from that first definition. What is an object in programming? It's an instance of a particular class or subclass with the class's own methods or procedures and data variables. In other words, the first three definitions of what an object is appear to be completely different from each other. Now, in truth, all of these definitions are correct, but none of them actually really help us to understand what an object is. And as a web developer, this gets further complicated when you see frequent references to what's known as the DOM or document object model, because it appears in order to fully understand what the document object model is, you also need to know what an object is because it sounds like the document object model makes use of these objects. So it's really difficult. It's something that should be a fairly straightforward question, but it's hard to get a straight answer from anyone. This is just part of the process. Sometimes you'll have to spend a long time looking for the definition. Other times you might come across a video like this. Hopefully we're gonna make things very clear in this video. But whether it's object or some other term, this type of issue crops up fairly commonly in programming. Another example is API. Search for the definition of API and you will get tons of different definitions of what exactly an API is, with examples being given which don't seem to match up with the other examples being given. It almost seems that you just have to learn about these things through use. The other aspect to this is that the description someone's after of a certain term is related to their current level of understanding. You see that first Wikipedia definition of an object that we looked at is completely correct. It just doesn't apply to anyone who's not already an advanced programmer. But of course, the irony is if someone was an advanced programmer, they'd probably already know what an object is. They wouldn't be looking at the Wikipedia article to find out what an object is. So one might wonder, who is that definition really for? So how are we going to define an object completely differently from the definitions we've seen so far? After working with objects for quite a number of years in different programming languages, I've decided that the easiest way to define an object for someone who's relatively new to programming is that it's a variable that stores key value pairs. A basic level definition of an object does not need to be any more complex than that. Some of the definitions we've looked at so far describe the features and characteristics of an object, but that's not really the definition of an object itself. You should think of an object as a variable that stores a set of key value pairs. Part of the reason why it's called an object is because if we think about the term object in English, it's an item of nondescript shape. Until we describe what that object is, it could be any shape or size. And we'll see that these key value pairs can take on their own shape. And the reason for this is when we have a key and a value, well, that value could actually be another object, could be another set of key value pairs. And inside that object, some of the values in the key value pairs of that object could also be objects. So you can see we start building a structure of nondescript shape. Let's have a quick look at how this works in JavaScript. So we have const my object or my obj for short, and we simply need to define key value pairs here. So to borrow some values from the W3 docs, we are going to define a car here. So we'll have name, fiat, 
which is going to be a string. We will have model, which is going to be 500, which will also set as a string rather than integer. We'll have weight, which is going to be 850 kgs. We'll define all of these as strings. You could, of course, define this an integer. In fact, let's do that. Let's say weight 850. So that's obviously an integer now because it's not wrapped in single quotes. And we'll say color is white. That's probably specific to the type of car. You could probably get the same car in different colors. That needs to be a string also. So we have now defined an object. You can see how it's just a list of key value pairs. And we can actually console log my obj. Let's have a look what we get. So you have the wrong type of brackets here around my obj. It needs to be the regular brackets for a function. Let's try that again. And we simply get the object echoed back to us. If we wanted to make use of the type of operator, let's see what we get. You see we get the result object. So this is a variable of type object that we're looking at right now. Now there are at least two different ways that we can access the values of this object. So one of the methods you'll see very commonly employed in JavaScript is to use a dot notation. So if we do my dot name, and we're just going to console log this as well. Let's run this script. So we get fiat echo to the screen. And we can do this for any of the properties of the object. So just thinking momentarily about the difference between a variable and a property and the difference between a function and a method, it really depends on the context. So when we think about name, this is really a type of variable, right? It's a variable that stores the value fiat. But because this particular variable lives inside an object, the correct technical name for this is it's a property. It's a property of the object. Now, in a similar way, objects can also store functions. But in the context of living inside an object, a function is now referred to as a method. Now, we'll add a function to this object shortly. But first of all, we said that there is more than one way of accessing the object properties. The other way is making use of the index notation. So rather than the dot notation that we see right now, my object dot model, we can instead pass in model to the index. And you can see we get 500 back because we're looking at the object at the index model. So it's a named index, very similar to an associative array. Now, for the most part, there isn't really a very big difference between the dot notation and the index notation. However, there is one potential advantage to the index notation, and that is we could actually pass a variable in here. So just to give an example, if we say let my var equals and we'll just give it the name model. Now, instead of typing in model, we could actually pass in my var instead. That obviously evaluates to the string model, which then returns 500 because that's the value of this object at the key model. Whereas if we try to do this with dot notation, it's not going to work. So we can use model, but we can't use my var. But if we want to use my var, we can do so using the index notation. Okay, so we said it's also possible to store a function on the object. We're going to refer to it as a method because it lives inside an object. So let's call our method details. And as the value for the details key, we'll pass a function. So we'll type function. Obviously, when we are declaring a function, we then need to make use of these curly brackets. And inside this function, we will return the name. Now, how do we access the name property? Well, since we're already inside the object and we want to access a property of the object, we can make use of the JavaScript keyword this. And you'll see this in many different coding languages where we can make use of a keyword such as this to access object properties from within inside the object. So we'll say return this dot name concatenated with a space and then we'll concatenate this dot model. Then we'll end our function with a semicolon. Okay, so now let's console log out the value of my obj.details. Let's see what we get. So we can see that we get a function returned to us, but it hasn't been executed. It's just been returned. So you can see JavaScript doesn't care that much. It just calls it a function, despite the fact that it's on an object. So you can see really these two are pretty much the same thing, but technically we should refer to this .details as a method. 
So how do we execute that method? Well, we need to make use of these function brackets. So if we run this, we now get fiat 500 return from this function. So it's simply looking at the object, it's then concatenating this dot model onto the end of this dot name and then returning it as a string. Now I'll say this further helps us to understand the idea of an object because this JavaScript object actually represents a real life object that is a car. And we know that cars come in different shapes and sizes. And so we can see with this object, we have different values. We have strings, we have integers, an object like a car has functions or methods as we call them in this case. So does our JavaScript object. And we can store other types of data as well. For example, let's add another property here. We'll just call it tire pressure. In fact, let's just call it tires. And we're actually going to save an array here and we will save the array of the tire pressures. These may not be the actual tire pressures. So if you have a Fiat 500, then probably don't use these values for your tires. We need to make sure we end the previous key value pair with a comma. Notice that syntax there, everything's ended with a comma. Apart from the last key value pair, which doesn't need to be ended with a comma, although it is optional in some languages. So now if we return myobj.tires, see what we get. We actually get an array back and we can access the various indexes on that array. So we could say my tires at index two, and we're going to get the third item in the array. The really cool thing is that we can also store objects on the object. So we could have features as the key, but we'll actually pass in another object here. So the value of this key is actually an object, which then contains its own key value pairs. This could be the features of the car. So we could say something like sat nav true, power steering. I mean, I would hope <laughs> that the car had power steering. We'll say true. And we'll say Bluetooth, let's just say false. So we have a different value. So you can see here, we've actually passed an object here as the value of one of the keys on our object. So let's see if we can access these values. So it's going to be my objectfeatures. Let's just return that on its own first of all. And we actually get an object returned because the value of that key is an object itself. So we can actually now say my objectfeatures.satnav and we get the value true. Whereas if we say my objectfeatures.bluetooth, we get the value false. So this is part of the reason why the term object is used. We can see that this particular object is taking on a very unique shape where some of the levels of the object have secondary levels. It makes use of different types of data such as arrays, strings, integers. The shape can ultimately end up being anything just like the shape of an object in real life can end up being anything we want it to be. But if we strip things down to a really simple level, what are we actually looking at here? We're looking at a data structure that consists of key value pairs. And this is the simplest and probably most important definition of an object in programming.